Hi folks, Denise Howell here. And up next on Triangulation, I'm joined by Nicole Black. Nicole is a lawyer, an author, a blogger, and the legal tech evangelist at My Case. We're gonna talk about 21st century's version of flashing one's headlights to warn of a speed trap, false friends in law enforcement, sex offenders and the First Amendment, and the darker side of Instagram. All this and more on Triangulation. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 390, recorded March 22nd, 2019. Technology, the Constitution, and the workplace. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Capterra. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Visit Capterra's free website at capterra.com slash triangulation. And by ZipRecruiter. Hiring is challenging, but there's one place you can go where hiring is simple and smart. That place is ZipRecruiter, where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. Hi folks, I'm Denise Howell and you're joining us for Triangulation. I'm thrilled you're here with us today because my longtime good friend from the online arena, Nikki Black is here with us. Hi Nikki, it's great to see you. Good to see you too, thanks for having me. Uh, really, I've just been dying to sit down, have some tea and a long talk <laughs> with a good old friend who's been rattling around online uh, for you know roughly as long as I have. Uh, Nikki is a lawyer, author, blogger, and she is the legal tech evangelist at My Case, which is a law practice management software company. Um, and Nikki, you've just sort of been there, done that, still there, still doing it for so long. I really appreciate the opportunity to sit down with you and have a talk about um, your background and uh, various things that you've been writing about and paying attention to on the substantive legal front, uh, what you're doing professionally and, and sort of the realm of enterprise technology as it relates to the legal field in particular, but sort of generally the realm of enterprise tech. Uh, and also just uh, have check in on the state of the web, which you and I have been rattling around for um, <laughs> longer than we probably both care to admit. So uh, let's just get into it. Um, first of all, why don't you uh, tell us a bit about your background for um, those of our listeners who haven't been uh, following you and reading you for years and years like I have. Uh, you started out in your legal career as a criminal defense lawyer, correct? Right, I was a um, public defender here in, I'm in Rochester, New York. I've been here for most of my adult life. I, uh, in 1995, I, started interning for the Monroe County Public Defender's Office here. And then I uh, worked for them. I was hired and worked for about four years. Then I was um, with a civil litigation firm for another four years after that. I sort of felt like I needed to regroup because I wasn't quite on the path that I knew I needed to be on. So I took a few years off. And um, after about two and a half years, I hung my shingle online. I created a website. I've always been really interested in tech. In fact, at the civil litigation firm that I um, had worked at, I created a website for them in 2002 using Dreamweaver before I left the firm. Dreamweaver mm -hmm. before I left the firm. Um, but so I hung a created a website, hung a shingle doing contract work for lawyers in 2005. Uh, shortly after that, I became of counsel to a DWI defense firm in town, and also in 2005 I started my blog, Sui Generous, and that's probably right about when we first became aware of each other. That's a blog about. Uh, it eventually became a blog about the intersection of law and tech. And from there, I met all sorts of people, yourself included, online and offline. Um, and everything that I've done since then really originated with that blog. And seven years ago, I was hired by my case as a legal tech evangelist. And between 2005 and being hired by my case in 2012, I wrote um, Cloud Computing for Lawyers that the ABA published in 2012. I co-authored Social Media for Lawyers with Carolyn Elephant in 2010. And I also am the co-author of Criminal Law New York. It's a Thomson Reuters substantive criminal law treatise that I continue to um, write, co you know, update each year annually as new cases come down. And I've also, I also write and speak 
about the intersection of law and technology on multiple sites across the web, including ABA Journal, Above the Law, the My Case blog, still at Sui Generis, uh, the Daily Record. I write weekly articles that are syndicated nationally, and I republish those at Sui Generis. Yeah, we may so as there. well have you uh, remind us what the Latin is. What does Sui Generis mean? Um, uh, unique. It's uh, ah. something that's unique in and of itself. If I'm Perfect. correct, it's been a long time since I thought about that. I had to think. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to check in and know what your blog is called. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, wonderful. And and uh, the, the American Bar Association, if you did not exist, would have to invent you or create you. I'm I'm convinced because um, <laughs> you you are so their uh, voice in so many ways for um, what is cutting edge technology and and how we move forward. Uh, responsibly as a profession uh, with technology hand in hand with it. So um, uh, it seems like you have landed in a great place in your life and and you continue to um, author columns on the criminal law stuff too and, and the treatise that you mentioned. So I think that's where we're going to start the show is with some interesting cases that uh, you've highlighted in your writing um, on issues that affect uh, all of us uh, here in the US and possibly globally um, as um, law enforcement and others uh, consider the impact or run up against the impact of the technology that people use in their daily lives. And um, the first, uh, in, in fact, this first piece is called When Technology and Law Enforcement Collide. Uh, you wrote this back in February. And it's it's a delightful story if people have not been paying attention to it. I tried to update it this morning to see if the other shoe has yet dropped and I could find no evidence that it has. But uh, back in February, the NYPD got in touch, reached out to Google who owns Waze. And uh, they said, now, come on, Google, we see here that your users, your Waze users, are alerting each other where there are speed traps and DWI checkpoints so that they can avoid those things. And we don't like it a bit. We think it's dangerous. We think it's reckless. Uh, and we would like you to stop. Um, as far as I know, uh, there's there's no uh, reporting that I see out there that, that Google responded or did anything about this demand. If you know otherwise, Nikki, please let us know. Uh, but. Uh, you, uh, when you wrote this up, uh, observed that, yeah, this is not exactly new. <laughs> that people have right. been tipping each other off to where they might encounter a law enforcement officer and perhaps they might want to avoid that place for their own various reasons. Uh, in various ways, sort of as long as there has been law enforcement. Um, so it, describe to us though, um, what the First Amendment ramifications are of this request? Well, it's the it's a governmental entity trying to stifle the rights of citizens to speak publicly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, any type of um, uh, it's admittedly ways is somewhat of a closed system, but it's still public, and the police are trying to stifle that, and so that can be problematic. Um, and it's interesting to me too that the police are trying to do that when they love to embrace technology in order to solve crimes or just trample on the rights of the citizens. <laughs> so, you know, they're perfectly willing to embrace AI for facial recognition, even though AI tends to be, when it comes to facial recognition, somewhat racist and sexist, uh, in part due to its programming and then its interactions with the world. So, when uh, Amazon's facial AI recognition system a while back was tested against members of Congress. They decided that a lot of the minority members of Congress matched the mug shots of known criminals. So it was clearly evidence that the AI was in using some improper analyses to reach this conclusion that the Congress people were criminals simply because of the color of their skin. And that clearly has ramifications in the law enforcement space. You know, if the AI can't accurately read the faces of minorities, then it's going to inaccurately, it's going to provide inaccurate results. So the police are perfectly comfortable using that type of technology. And yet they seem to be 
unwilling to allow the people to notify others that there is a DWI um, checkpoint. We, we've done this forever, you know, we're flashing our lights to let people know there's a speed trap up ahead. And so, you know, it, I, I honestly think the MYP should have thought twice than my PD before they did that. But um, I, and I haven't heard of anything since then in terms of what's come of it. So I think it's probably just a pending request that hasn't been acted on. But yeah, I, I think that's where things stand. Um, you mentioned in your article, um, if if the NYPD did have something legitimate to talk about here, as as they claim they do, um, that they're uh, that there's a danger. The posting of such information, they say, for public consumption is irresponsible since it only serves to aid impaired and intoxicated drivers to evade checkpoints and encourage reckless driving. Revealing the location of checkpoints puts those drivers, their passengers, and the general public at risk. Um, so it seems, and you honed in on this in your piece, that what they're trying to trigger is this notion that we're all familiar with from wherever we first heard this old saw that you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, that there is there are exceptions to the parameters of what the First Amendment protects. And, and as I always like to remind people when discussing the First Amendment, uh, and you already raised the point, Nikki, is is that it applies to government actions. So it definitely is um, triggered here. This is a police department asking that Google take um, various measures. Uh, so we've got that qualification satisfied. Um, and what they seem to be about here is arguing that there should be this exception to curtailing speech where it's okay under the constitution to curtail speech because there's some sort of imminent danger involved in what Google is enabling through the Waze app. Um, can you speak to that for a moment? Uh, your take on first, whether this would fall within that kind of exception? I'd have to read, uh Refresh my recollection on that line of cases. I'm certainly aware of the, um, you know, that um, public safety exception mm -hmm. and that that concept of yelling fire in a crowded place. And I can see how they might allege that it or assert that it falls under that exception. But I think that what they're making of an, a presumption that people are, or an assumption that the reason that people would avoid the checkpoint is because they were intoxicated. Certainly, some people would avoid the checkpoint because they're intoxicated or thought perhaps they were. But others, like myself, would probably just avoid the checkpoint because I don't like interacting with the police. As a former public defender and a criminal defense attorney, I'm very aware of how things can quickly go awry. Um, I find it anxiety producing to um, interact with the police, even though I consider myself to be a law abiding citizen. So I think that they're operating under this assumption that the only people that are going to be avoiding it are those who are actually impaired. I think that that's not necessarily true. And I'm not sure that it, I, like I said, I'd have to read the line of cases, but I think that it's a little bit of a reach to say that by notifying people that there's a checkpoint that that puts all, uh, and if some people avoid it because they're impaired, that that puts others in imminent risk of harm. You know, certainly some people might not actually be impaired or they may be impaired, but they're driving well enough to not be impaired under the law. Um, and some may be intoxicated and avoiding it because of that. But I don't think it causes that imminent risk of harm that is discussed in those cases. But again, I'd have to refresh my recollection and make sure that my uh, conclusion there actually falls under that. Um, the analysis in that line of cases, but yep, absolutely. Um, let's let's move on to another um, interesting area of the law when it comes to uh, constitutional rights and criminal procedure and defense, uh, and that has to do with something um, that I remember first encountering in <clears throat> 2011 or so. We did an episode of this week in law that was called. Colorado grandmothers for 200, Alex, <laughs> that was, uh, as far <laughs> as I can recall, the, f the first time I'd seen a case where um, so this debate about um, the Fifth Amendment and unlocking your devices 
uh, had come up front and center. Um, and there are various ways you can unlock a device. One is with a password, which most courts have held to be testimonial um, and thus protected by the Fifth Amendment. That if you know you say, no, I'm invoking my Fifth Amendment rights, I know you would like my password to unlock my device, but I'm not gonna give it to you, um, that a court wouldn't under those circumstances, under most of the law out there, compel you to do so. Um, but uh, biometrics have been treated differently. Uh, most courts right. have, have decided that those are not testimonial. They're not something in your head. Um, and that you know either thing can relate to your guilt or innocence in the case, but there is a chain of decisions out there saying yes, your fingerprint, your face, your iris, whatever may be required to unlock this device is fair game uh, if law enforcement needs access. Uh, you can't invoke the Fifth Amendment there. So uh, there has been this strange dissonance between those two things because mostly, people think about this and go, wait a minute, they're not that different. <laughs> and right. that's what this court in Oakland earlier, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, the court wasn't in Oakland necessarily, but the case involved facts in Oakland, California, right. a district court in Northern California, um, had to consider uh, a search warrant that was issued. And it was a very broad warrant that, um, said that the police officers could go to search someone's home and that anyone on the premises could be required to uh, fork over supply their biometric information to unlock any devices that the police were interested in as part of their investigation. So that um, warrant came under scrutiny and went before the court and the court decided, well, first of all, it's too broad. Um, in who you're cap capturing in this search warrant. Um, it should be limited to the suspects. And then secondly, and interestingly for uh, considering the intersection of technology and the law, um, the court went on to say, yeah, this bio this distinction with biometrics, we, we're not buying it. Uh, we think this is testimonial. We think that uh, the evidence that's being gathered here goes to guilt or innocence. And the court noted that uh, as far as evidence from um, polygraph tests, the kind of galvanic skin response or whatever they're measuring there, um, those have been found to be testimonial in the past. And that's really where the court thought uh, this should go, that the analogy was uh, more to that than something that is testimonial because you've thought it up and it's in your head. Uh, anything to add on this, Nikki? Well, I think it's really interesting because it's just one more example of the courts and the laws trying to keep up with a rapid pace of technological advancement. And the courts are gonna go in all different directions on this and it's gonna have to go up to the Supreme Court just like other similar issues have. Um, there was just a case that Sharon Nelson wrote about today on her Ride the Lightning blog where a defendant was ordered to provide um, the cell phone password. <clears throat> and it was determined that that was not a violation of the Fifth Amendment. And in the past, <laughs> other courts have gone in the opposite direction on that. Same with the biometric. Some of, So, you know, the courts are reading these in completely different ways and interpreting these um, technologies and their application to the law in really different ways. And it's sort of, it's a difficult time um, <laughs> to, in terms of knowing what is actually, how things are actually gonna be interpreted. And it reminds me of in a slightly different um, uh, area of the law and, and technology. A couple of years ago, the, uh, the New York Ethics Committee um, was addressing certain social media ethics issues and whether lawyers could advertise on social media. And they issued this whole opinion about the specialty section of LinkedIn where that was an indication that lawyers were claiming that they had a specialty and they weren't allowed to do that. And by the time the opinion was issued, LinkedIn had removed that category from LinkedIn and it was no longer an issue. So they issued an opinion on a moot point. And so that's in some ways what is uh, happening. The technology is advancing. We had fingerprints and now we have um, facial recognition. And that you know when you're applying this technology to fingerprints, 
Facial recognition is a slightly different technology and could arguably be interpreted differently. And as each new version of these phones comes out with different types of technology that analyzes, um, that allows you access to the phone, you know, these determinations that they're making based upon one type of technology may not actually logically apply to the next type of technology that's almost immediately released within the next year. And the courts move slowly and the regulators move slowly. And so um, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this. But I, every time I come across one of these, I don't take it particularly seriously because I know that in two or three weeks, another court's going to come down on the other side of it. And you're going to have to wait till it filters its way up to actually get a determination that makes sense. And by the time that determination comes down, we're going to be on to the next technology and a whole <laughs> different type of analysis. So... <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right that um, what we've seen is is courts unable to really uh, reach consensus on this issue, and that ultimately it will be, it will come before the Supreme Court, um, and and maybe hopefully it won't be too late <laughs> as you're <laughs> suggesting. Um, they'll be able to give some guidance to uh, law enforcement and others, uh, the the defense side of the equation going forward as to what they can and cannot do. Uh, your conclusion when you wrote up the recent case in Northern California was that this was the correct result, that there's no reason to um, treat passwords differently than someone's finger, fingerprint or iris scan or or map, digital map of their face. Um, wh why do you think that's right? Well, I <clears throat> no matter what context I'm talking about technology over the years, and I've advised lawyers about using technology in their practices or understanding how technology works as it applies to um, running their firms or actually representing their clients, is that the online is simply an extension of the offline. And the best opinions are those that look for offline analogies and rather than coming up with some hard and fast rule regarding this particular type of technology or such as the specialty section of LinkedIn or fingerprint access versus um, facial recognition or even biometric access in general. That it's better to apply the law as it was before technology came along and try and find an, an analogous situation. And in this case, I think that you know the, what the court had said that really <clears throat> resonated with me was how it talked about, it quoted the Riley v. California opinion, the Supreme Court's 2014 opinion, but it talked about how smartphones are mini computers and a search of them would typically expose the government to far more than the most exhaustive search of a house. A phone not only contains a digital, in digital form, many sensitive records previously found in the home, it also contains a broad array of private information never found in a home in any form. So, it, you know, what they're saying is that if you can't access that information in a house without a warrant, you shouldn't be able to access that, inf access that information on a phone in the absence of a warrant. And in fact, the phone may actually, um, people may actually have a greater privacy interest in their phones than they even do in their homes because of the amount of private information that's contained on them. So I think that that's the, that was the correct decision reached in this case based upon that type of um, rationale. And I think that in the future, the correct decisions are going to sort of go along that idea that phones are MIDI computers that have an incredible amount of private and sensitive information on them. And that is going to be the determinative factor. Um, and it reminds me of a case years ago that a New York court had issued where they were trying to ascertain, <clears throat> ascertain whether someone's private messages on Facebook were discoverable in a case. and. I always hearken back to this when I speak to lawyers about technology, because what the judge said in that case was that those private messages, the DMs between two people were akin to something that someone would put in a diary. And so therefore it needed to be treated in that way. And there had to be, they had to show relevancy and the belief that there would actually be relevant information found in there before they would allow that to be turned over. So you couldn't just have a blank fishing expedition in terms of everything that's in this person's Facebook account. And so what I liked about that was how they analogized it to a diary just in this case, how they analogize the contents of the phone to at least what's found in your home and possibly that it contains even more private data than what you'd find in someone's home because of the nature of these phones and how much information they contain. So I. I really do think that that's where these cases should be going. And hopefully that's what the higher courts are going to, the determinations they come to are gonna be based on that type of analogy. Yeah, and it's sense. worth it's worth mentioning, I totally <clears throat> agree with you. And it's worth mentioning along those lines that the only reason we're talking about 
different ways of securing data on devices is because the technology companies themselves and their customers are looking for ways to make that data more and more secure. Um, the, the tech companies and the people who use their products aren't looking to make life easy for law enforcement necessarily. They're looking for um, the most personal privacy and security that <clears throat> they can have that's technologically feasible. Um, and that's not, as you pointed out uh, when we were talking about avoiding DUI checkpoints, it's not necessarily because they're involved in any kind of illegal activity. It's just that uh, protecting the confidentiality and privacy of one's data is becoming more and more important, both in a professional and personal context. Um, so there's going to be continued demand. It's demand that has led to this situation in the first place. And it's demand that has sound policy reasons behind it. It's not like this technology exists to avoid the police. It exists because mm -hmm. data needs to be secure. Um, right. So, uh, you know, I hope that that, in addition to the the volume of data and, and the kinds of things um, that you're talking about from the Riley decision. Um, I hope that future courts, as they consider this, uh, will take into account that yeah, security and privacy are things that are, are vitally necessary to um, the function of both business in all kinds of contexts, certainly in our in our businesses context in the legal arena, we are charged with keeping all kinds of things private and confidential and secure. Um, and also um, for people in their personal lives too. All right, let's move on to another really interesting story. Um, similar to what we've been discussing, I think it fits right in with some of the things we've already discussed today. Um, and this is uh, whether the Fourth Amendment should apply to prevent, the Fourth Amendment uh, is the thing that protects us all from unreasonable search and seizure. Uh, of, and of course, that's what we're talking about relating to getting into our devices here. Uh, what if the material, the evidence that law enforcement seeks to use against you isn't locked up on your device, but instead, if they could only get at it, it's on a server where you've posted it to social media, but you haven't posted it publicly. You've posted, you've put one of these uh, protections on that I want to get into that in a minute too. Uh, that says we're going to let you limit the audience for uh, this post or this photo, um, and perhaps it's only available to your friends. Perhaps it's only available to this designated group of friends that you've specified. We're going to let you. Um, <coughs> set up those parameters and then post away. Uh, well, that's what this case, Everett versus uh, Delaware uh, was about. And uh, the person in question, the suspect in question, had voluntarily accepted a friend request from someone who actually turned out to be an undercover police officer investigating this person uh, who had a lengthy criminal record, um, various convictions that prevented the person from owning firearms. And guess what? The person was posting photos of themselves with firearms on Facebook. Um, so this was an attempt to show that this person was violating the law and uh, continuing to violate the law. And uh, an undercover uh, police officer uh, made false friends with this person on Facebook. And uh, that came under challenge as, hey, you know, they can't do that. This is violating my Fourth Amendment rights. The court in Delaware disagreed. And uh, even though the person thought that they were limiting their reach to people who were actually friends, I guess, um, <laughs> that thought was <clears throat> not reasonable. Uh, it was not unreasonable for the police to uh, try and gather evidence in this way as far as the court was concerned. So there was no problem uh, with uh, the police activity here. The Fourth Amendment didn't apply. And, you know, the takeaway is be careful, not only be careful what you post, but be careful who you friend and how these limiting technologies may or may not work. 
Um, did you agree with the outcome of this t- case? Do you think that there could be a situation where uh, the police could violate the Fourth Amendment amendment by deceiving someone um, as to um, their online relationship? I tend to think that the court made the correct decision in this case because it's sort of a caveat emptor. If you're going to participate online and accept friend requests, then you need to know who you're accepting the request from. If you don't know the person, um, you probably shouldn't accept that request, especially if you are going to be posting things that might somehow be detrimental to you. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, The Fourth Amendment implications in this case were, I think, a bit of a a stretch. I think it was an interesting argument. But one thing that I think is interesting about it, though, is I tend to um, write and speak on the issue of lawyers and what they can and can't do is, um, although I like to really follow the, the intersection of law enforcement and technology as well. But, you know, lawyers in this situation would not in most almost every jurisdiction are ethically prohibited from friending somebody without telling them that it's for the purposes of litigation to get information to help in litigation. Same with a lawyer's mm-hmm. agents. So mm-hmm. a private investigator or a paralegal, same thing if the lawyer asks them to do that. And mm-hmm. in this case, the police are not bound by the same set of ethics um, that lawyers are. So it's it's interesting to me that in, you know, the law enforcement can go around and friend people. Uh, it, it, with some deception involved, I doubt that it said, you know, Joe or Susie Smith was a police officer. I, I'm pretty sure that that's not what their profile said, because this person never would have accepted the friendship, I, I'm assuming. Um, but they're allowed to use this deception in for the purposes of um, investigating a case. The prosecutors, on the other hand, are not. And there was just a case that I <clears throat> wrote about where a prosecutor in, uh, I want to say Philadelphia, um, uh, prosecutors are considered an arm of law enforcement, correct in their own way. And she, uh, after there was a ethics opinion issued in Philadelphia, um, saying that lawyers cannot engage in deception, had told her whole office, the district attorney herself, to create false Facebook pages and then friend people that had pending cases, and they did. And the um, she lost her license for a year. So the prosecutors cannot do that, but the and investigators can't do that at the prosecutor's behest, whether it's private investigators or police investigators, detectives and the like. But if they're doing it of their own volition, then the only issue you're dealing with is this the constitutional issues. And I think that it's in terms of whether that constitutes some sort of Fourth Amendment infringement, I really don't think that it does. I think this case probably was correct. It's a little bit of a reach in my opinion. Yeah, I, I'm with you on all those fronts. And I think that <clears throat> where we might see more litigation around this is is in that piece of the representations that are made to people by social network uh, platforms um, in some instances that, yes, you're limiting your audience here. or That's what we're enabling you to do and what that means and what people can and should believe about that when – uh, they're operating that way. Of course, Cambridge Analytica taught us all that that limiting your audience might not mean what you think it means. Um, but I, I, I think right. it does provide a lot of people with a false sense of security as to who's going to see what and going to be able to access what. And I think they feel this um, sort of almost a fiduciary trust relationship with the data <clears throat> that they're handing over. Um, it's almost like, you know, I, I'm merely outsourcing to you. You're my server, um, and and we have this understanding about who can access what's on my server, uh, which is um, probably not the right way to think about it. But I think a lot of people do think about it that way, whether they're conscious of it or not. And and I I think that that clash of understanding or conception might lead to um, other issues to talk about in other cases along these lines. Um, do you think what? it's a good idea just just generally for social platforms? You know, obviously some platforms, you either can protect all your posts um, or none of them. And, and you can't 
tailor a specific audience to a post. Do you have an opinion one way or another about uh, um, those kinds of practices? Well, at the end of the day, <clears throat> we talked about this a lot, Carolyn and I did in the social media for lawyers book. You know, you got to determine what your goals are when you're interacting online. And if you, you know, if you're an influencer and you make your money somehow from your online interactions, obviously you want everyone to see it. If you are marketing your business, um, you want others to see what you're <laughs> posting online. If you're talking to your friends, you may want to reconsider or if you're sharing stuff that, I mean, quite frankly, I think people, you know, the, even with Snapchat back in the day, this idea that, oh, the it goes away right away. Well, everybody's just getting screenshots of the Snapchat. So the internet's forever. So at the end of the mm -hmm. day, I think everyone, regardless of whether they're interacting for professional purposes, business purposes, or personal purposes, needs to really think just for a split second before they post. Um, and they certainly shouldn't drink and tweet is what I always like to say, because <laughs> you're going to regret it, you know, <laughs> so you, <clears throat> I, I, you know, you really need to carefully think about why you're interacting and what you're trying to achieve. And then also how what you're posting, if it's just for personal purposes, could come back to bite you. And, I, and the thing about being behind these safety <clears throat> privacy walls that I also wanted to bring up is even if, uh, you know, there's all sorts of interesting issues um, why don't you talk about lawyers and the ethical issues that there's a court um, and whether they uh, there's a corollary to um, in the with the idea of cops and the Fourth Amendment. So so yes, uh, probably an officer can friend you, but other things that can happen. Even if you were to say that somehow that was an unlawful search, well, what if the uh, there's somebody who is a colleague of yours or a friend of yours who gets arrested and they <clears throat> they flip. And then they're working for the police and they're already friends with you, mm -hmm. you know, and that predates their um, flipping and becoming a witness in some sort of prosecution. That must happen if, all the time, I would think. Right. And that predates, you know, so even if you were to say that the police could not, for some, for the Fourth Amendment purposes, friend you, in that case, they still have access to that information through a back door that's sounds perfectly lawful to me, Fourth Amendment notwithstanding. So regardless of who you are, you never know how the information you're posting, whether it's behind a privacy wall or a public, is going to be used. And so you really want to think because it is forever. It doesn't go away even if you delete it. And you really need to think twice. And and <clears throat> there's always the strides and effect and the thing that's going on with noon is now that you know the minute that you litigate something like this, which is a different issue, but the more attention that's brought to it, that um, Nuna's <clears throat> litigation, that account that he wanted Twitter to take down now has like, it had 5,000 followers. Now it has, you know, a quarter of a million as of the filing of the lawsuit because he decided to call attention to it. So there's all sorts of different things you need to think about when you're interacting online, <laughs> but regardless of whether it's behind a privacy wall or not. All right, we have one more uh, case that you've written up that I'd like to discuss, uh, but before we do that, we're going to thank our first sponsor for this episode of Triangulation, and that is Captera. We've all read some surprising online reviews, right? Whether you're trying to get a sweet deal on something you've been saving for or trying to find the best happy hour in town, it's generally a good idea to read the reviews first. So why should finding the right software for your business be any different? You can read thousands of real software reviews and find the right software for your business at captera.com slash triangulation. Captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business. With over 750,000 reviews of products from real software users, discover everything you need to make an informed decision. Search more than 700 specific categories of software, everything from project management to email marketing to yoga studio management software. No matter what kind of software your business needs, Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution first. Please join the millions of people who use Captera each month to find the right tools for their business. So one thing you can search for on Captera is uh, if you're a small law firm looking for an easy to use practice management software to manage case details, documents, contacts, time tracking, billing, and invoicing all in one place, 
like Nikki's company, my 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 right. case, sorry, um, you're gonna you're gonna find that you've been reviewed on Captera, and and sure enough, my case is on Captera. It's got four and a half stars out of five, uh, with 241 reviews, and uh, this looks to be a great way um, not just to learn about. Uh, the practice management software, but from the company's standpoint, a great way to interact with uh, its enthusiastic users who are leaving reviews and to uh, try and assuage anybody who isn't having such a positive experience. Uh, Nikki, you were familiar with Captera. We talked about it a bit before the show. Any thoughts? It's interesting that you bring that up. Um, you know, Captera is a great resource and in my case, we're all about customer feedback. It's uh, customer listening to customers is in our DNA, and it kind of drives everything that we do in terms of features and updates to the platform, so that we can provide even um, a, a better experience for our customers in terms of helping them run their small law firms as efficiently as possible. And so, Captera is one of the many avenues that we use in that regard, and it's great to get our customers' feedback, and we read every single one of them and then respond, and also forward that information along to the product team so that they can incorporate it into their product roadmap. So it's useful in uh, many different ways, for sure. So if you would like to fill your business's <clears throat> software needs and make sure that you're getting the right product for the right task, you should visit capterra.com slash triangulation to find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. That's capterra.com slash triangulation. C A P T E R R A dot com slash triangulation. Captera, software selection simplified. All right. Thanks for your help with that, Nikki. That was serendipitous <laughs> that you guys were in there. Um, our yep. final case that uh, Nikki wrote up that I'd like to discuss before we move on to some other things um, had to do again with the First Amendment and social media and the intersection between the two. And uh, you might remember this from a couple of years ago. Uh, the case uh, was a Supreme Court case called Packenham versus North Carolina. And what it considered was the state of North Carolina enacted a law, uh, a criminal statute that provided it was going to be a felony if you were a registered sex offender who wished to thereafter use social media if those social media sites could be accessed by children, uh, and of course, most of them can. So um, it, pretty much if you're a registered sex offender, you're using social media, uh, you're gonna be charged with a felony in the state of North Carolina if this law had continued to be on the books. Uh, the Supreme Court struck it down and found that this was a First Amendment violation <laughs> and spent a good deal of time sort of considering the First Amendment and and uh, its relationship to the social media platforms that a lot of people are using for speech. Now, when I read through this, and we'll talk more about the case itself and the court's observations about social media, but again, I, the thing that popped right into my mind is, okay, so the state of North Carolina couldn't do this, but if the if Facebook or Twitter or someone else wanted to bar uh, registered sex offenders from the platform and make it a terms of service or a community community guidelines violation to be a registered sex offender using the platform. They could do that and it wouldn't be a First Amendment violation, at least as far as First Amendment law stands right now. I think this case and others since um, begin to demonstrate sort of a, a mental shift uh, on the part of courts to conceiving of these platforms as less of private enterprise, which is where my interpretation goes, that they could bar people based on their, you know, based on anything, basically, because they're a private company making private rules, uh, and more of a public square. And I, I do think that that. Um, that is a bookmark that issue to be continued. Keep watching it because I think the um, the courts are grappling with that. Do you agree, Nikki? <clears throat> I mean, I think they are. The thing about social media is that it amplifies a single person's voice in a way that 
in a cost effective way, a free, you know, it's free <laughs> as long as you have the tools to access it in a way that has never been available before. So, you know, but for um, the ability, the internet and the ability to blog and then social media to amplify my voice, I might not be where I am now. When I started blogging into the ether in 2005, um, I, at, at that point, if I was writing, uh, to the editor or letters to the editor or something, I never would have ended up with this amplification of my voice that helped me uh, um, encounter all these opportunities professionally. The same thing can be said for anyone when it comes to social media. It really amplifies people's voices and technology speeds things up and provides more opportunities to do things. And artificial intelligence is kind of like when Ford came out with the, um, the oh, I'm having a mind blank, the line, uh, the, not the construction line, but you know, the, in the automobile factories, <laughs> the line that allowed them to much more efficiently put the cars together. So it's the same thing. AI does the same thing. It sort of takes all these rote mechanisms and speeds them along. Social media amplifies someone's voice. That's just what technology does. And the best court decisions, the courts are going to grapple with it. But as I had said before, the best court decisions are the ones that take the online and analogize it to offline conduct. And when I wrote about this case, that's exactly what I noted was that the majority did what I consider to be the hallmark of every well decided decision. And they analogized the online conduct to offline conduct, whereas the dissent did what I think is incredibly problematic and they had this knee jerk reaction to tech. So the <clears throat> majority basically said that the ordinance was no different than other offline um, ways that you can express yourself and they allowed the, and that's why they struck the law down. But the dissent sort of took a knee jerk reaction and said that cyberspace is different from the physical world. And if it's true as the court believes, we cannot appreciate yet the full dimensions and vast potential of the cyber age, we should proceed circumspectly taking it one step at a time. And I find that that happens across the board, whether it's in court opinions, whether it's lawyers trying to decide whether to use cloud computing. When my book came out in 2012, and I'd been trying to convince them for years that this is where we're going, cloud computing is the wave of the future. And they all somehow thought that by providing their third party data or their data to a third party online, you know, in terms of data rather than just papers was somehow different. But I kept saying the offline storage of papers is no different than the online storage of data. And you've been doing this forever. It's just a matter of using that same type of process of vetting the provider that you do when someone's storing paper documents for you versus digital data. So, but a lot of lawyers that they know digital data is somehow different. And I would argue that across the board, it's not different. You can take 99% of the time, these analogies to offline conduct and apply them to the online conduct. In this case, um, sexual predators and whether they can use social media and whether that's uh, pro prohibiting them from doing so is a violation of their First Amendment rights when the government's the one prohibiting them. So it, I guess that was sort of a circumspect way of going about it. <laughs> I think I went in circles here, but I, I, I think that the court came to the right decision. And I think that the best decisions that um, in terms of this technology and future types of technology are going to be the ones where the court doesn't have this knee jerk reaction to the tech and instead, try, instead tries to understand it and then apply these offline analogies to the um, technology. Right, and the analogy in that case that, that you approved of that the court relied on had to do with um, the, I guess the city of Los Angeles tried to uh, prevent various speech activities, let's see, they tried to prohibit, quote, any First Amendment activities at LAX, uh, the right. airport. <clears throat> um, and so uh, that overbroad ordinance, you could see, could sweep in things like talking or reading or wearing a button or T-shirt with your, you know, political view of choice. Um, so it was challenged and it was stricken and that's what the court looked at here and said yeah this is this is too broad too and it um it began this discourse that i think we're seeing uh, evolve in the supreme court and and continue to hold sway there that um 
what they've said is the cyber age is a revolution of historic proportions. We cannot appreciate yet its full dimensions and vast potential to alter how we think, express ourselves and define who we wanna be. The forces and directions of the internet are so new, so protean and so far reaching, the courts must be conscious that what they say today might be obsolete tomorrow, which I believe you said earlier on in our show today. (laughs) Right. So The same uh, could be said about the printing press way back when, you know, it's just knee jerk reaction to something new and a new way of disseminating ideas. So it's. Exactly. Sometimes I get frustrated. (laughs) All right, well, let's let's talk about the state of the printing press and all the other tools that um, we use in our lives and in our professions. Um, since, as I mentioned, you know, you are the American Bar Association's go-to person on all things legal tech. Uh, we, um, on This Week in Law, uh, have had some very interesting guests uh, from time to time on the show uh, who are squarely in the middle of that. We had Andrew Aruda on, uh, who um, from Ross Intelligence, we had, I believe on the same show, Joshua Browder on, Mm -hmm. who is the guy who coded up the Do Not Pay app and is um, expanding that into Do Not Pay was a thing that would allow you to um, uh, challenge your, it would give you legal help in challenging your parking tickets. And now he has expanded into uh, what he's called Robot Lawyer, which is um, trying to uh, help people address all kinds of legal issues using AI to help them craft their response or their challenge or whatever to the legal thing they need to interact with. Um, so, so is that the big deal in enterprise tech quite right now? Is it all about the AI? Um, well, first of all, I just want to say that I do. I've written two books for the ABA and I write for the ABA Journal, but there are plenty of other people out there, not just me, who provide lots of knowledgeable information about um, lawn technology. And I would be a derelict if I didn't acknowledge that. Um, yeah, 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 and just then- take the compliment <laughs> and run with it. <laughs> uh, and uh, in terms of, I, I think right now AI is the most interesting thing to me. You know, it, mm-hmm. in 2005, I was super interested in blogs and then social media as that became a thing. And then it was, uh, mobile computing as the iPhone rolled out and then cloud computing because mobile computing isn't much without the cloud. And I knew that cloud was going to be the next big wave and then wearables when the Apple Watch came out. And now the thing I'm super excited about and I'm not the only one is uh, artificial intelligence. And and because of my particular perspective, it's application to the practice of law, whether it's um, running your law firm or representing clients. So uh, there's a number of different really interesting areas where artificial intelligence is really starting to show some promise in the um, terms of advancing certain aspects of practicing law. And those are the things I've been particularly interested in following. And I also am super interested in following the more tangential stuff. Uh, the, the All the robots that are being created and the things they're doing in autonomous driving. And um, there's a ton of incredibly interesting stuff I just read about. Uh, Scientists came up with a metal that stretches and is liquefied somewhat like the Terminator in uh, like the bad guys in Terminator. So the robots there. So there's tons of really interesting stuff in 4D printing. I just read about today as opposed to just 3D printing. So there's some really incredible things that are occurring right now. And we're in the middle of just a amazing time in terms of technological advancement and AIs at the cutting edge of it. So you're wait. You're telling me that side by side with developing really uh, vastly powerful artificial intelligence, we are also developing the same kind of metal that could create the Terminator that could melt and reshape and all that. <laughs> right. And the That's regulations, just like everything, are so far behind. I mean, they're not even close to regulating AI. And that's what all you're going to hear. All these people that are um, a lot more um, knowledgeable about AI than I am. Um, you know, the, I think that the um, Tesla guy I'm having a mind blank, you know, he and a number of others have said, including Stephen Hawking's, I think, prior to his death, that we need regulations and we need them now in terms of AI. And to prevent that, um, that, that singularity from happening, that sentience of the machines um, or having control over it when it does happen, because everyone says it's inevitable. And we'd rather have Star Trek 
versus uh, Terminator or the like. You know, you want this happy world where the machines and the people live alongside one another happily versus are battling with the machines winning <laughs> in every case in all sci-fi shows. So whenever right. we battle the machines, they win. <laughs> Elon Musk is so. who you were thinking of. Elon um, Musk, right. So, so are we, you, you see these tools and follow them. You just went to ABA's, the American Bar Association's tech show recent, recently, and they um, showcase and and uh, explain and let people uh, trot out the latest and greatest that they're offering for the profession. Do you see more of a Star Trek or a Terminator thing happening here? Well, in the legal space right now, it's certainly a uh, Star Trek. That's those are the less scary ones. It's the robots that are scary. There, are, at this point, <laughs> there are no robot lawyers. There, uh, that that is whatever. That's what everyone uses in their headlines for the sake of a um, uh, catchy headline, myself included. But right now in legal tech, I, I was at Legal Week in New York at the beginning of the year, and then ABA Tech Show a couple of weeks ago. And what you're really seeing, particularly more at Legal Week than ABA Tech Show, there's definitely some AI. At ABA Tech Show, um, there just there was just more because there's more exhibitors at Legal Week. But what you're seeing is, in the legal space at least, sort of three different categories of AI that are really interesting. One of them is legal research. Um, that's where Andrew Aruda from uh, Ross comes in, Case Text, uh, Thomson Reuters, and <clears throat> LexisNexis are also doing some really interesting things. LexisNexis has made a ton of really interesting acquisitions, um, and actually their acquisitions are more along some of them are research and some of them are related to the other category another category that's really interesting which is data analytics and we've been amassing all sorts of data now and the problem is sifting through that data a lot of it is pacer data about um, all the different court proceedings and the the problem everybody has had up until now not just in the legal space is all the data is being collected nsa had this problem when they were tapping all the americans phones sorting through the massive amounts of data that are collected and making sense of it and providing usable, actionable information. And so that's where this data analytics comes in, in e-discovery initially, but now you're seeing it um, in litigation analytics and also data analytics for large law firms to use in terms of determining how to run their firms more effectively and efficiently and getting all sorts of analytics about the knowledge management in their firms and also just how their firms are running and what the lawyers are doing. And then mm -hmm. the litigation analytics is super interesting because it allows um, lawyers to get information to decide where to actually file the case, You know what jurisdiction in federal court is gonna be the best place to file it for the result we want. And then once they're in front of a certain judge, what arguments can we make? What motions can we bring to achieve our desired result? If the judge always denies this one particular type of motion in this case, what other procedural mechanism can we use sort of as a backdoor method to achieve that same result where the judge is more likely to rule in our favor? And so you can see all these analytics about how the judges have decided things, how the opposing party, this law firm has handled different types of cases, how the expert witnesses in a particular type of case have um, who they've testified for, what they've said, what was precluded, what was allowed, you know, were they plaintiff for defense most of the time? Are they testifying a lot? Are they professional expert witnesses as opposed to somebody with expertise who just testifies occasionally? And then the last category is contract analytics. Mm -hmm. And that's where you'll see companies like Law Geeks, um, <clears throat> where what that allows you to do is take a contract like an NDA and um, Upload it into your upload it into the software and it compares it to hundreds of thousands of other similar contracts and it tells you instantaneously in a matter of seconds, you know, less than a minute. Here are the outlier clauses in this contract that rarely, if ever, appear in this contract. Here are these, there, here's a bunch of clauses over here that are always in this contract that don't appear. So it helps the lawyers hone in really quickly on the unusual aspects of the contract so that they can sift through them. Put what it, put what's in there that needs to be in there. Highlight what needs to be negotiated, and provide their clients with much more effect, cost effective, and um, much more um, at the end of the day accurate um, results in terms of analyzing that contract and providing their clients with advice. So those are really the three categories: legal research, data analytics, and contract analytics. Where I'm seeing some really interesting things in the legal space. Some of those are just analytics, and some of those actually become AI, where the machines instead of just um, the analogy I like to use is instead of having uh, um, the uh, in, in your car cruise control that's dynamic, meaning that 
when you're on the, if you've ever driven a car with dynamic cruise control, it will keep you in your lane. It will slow down when you approach other cars. But at the end of the day, if you're about to run into another car, you have to hit the brake. It doesn't make that decision for you. Autonomous driving, uh, autonomous cars will make that decision for you. And so that's mm -hmm. where the AI step comes in. So you're seeing different levels of that in the legal space in terms of these different categories. <clears throat> yeah, one interesting thing I noted is, is you know, back when I was in law school, uh, you had a couple of different ways that you would do legal research. I don't think that's the case anymore. I don't know if people still go and pull books off shelves and read cases that way. And, as, you know, there were various other books that would help you know, okay, if you're reading this case, then you might want to read these and these and these and these as well, because they're related and they follow on. And, but you did it all with books and paper. And right. uh, the, um, when I was in law school is when Lexis and Westlaw, the two big uh, legal research databases were giving all the law students free subscriptions so that they could do their research that way and get hooked on it, um, which we all did. And, and I think it pretty much wiped out the old way of doing research. And I uh, am noting that Ross Intelligence is doing the same thing now. It's giving subscriptions to law students. And I assume some of these other companies are right in there too, saying, well, you know, don't do it the old way, do it this way because it's better. And uh, <clears throat> we think that we think that, you know, you guys should uh, check it out. And then of course they'll go into private practice and and their firms will have to do it that way because that's how they know how to do it. <laughs> and, right. Um, so there's there's that component of it. Um, I, do, I do think we're probably headed toward uh, a realm where some of this stuff is just practice standard, that if you're not uh, using artificial intelligence to analyze your contracts or what have you, that, that you might be um, falling below some ethical standard that you might otherwise be held to. Um, and then the other thing that just sort of occurs to me thinking about all this is it all involves so much. We were talking about you know our profession's obligation to keep things um, private and secure, there's so much sharing involved and so many, I guess, crisis points that could occur as you're crunching the data along the way or having things make uh, artificially intelligent decisions and uh, determinations for you um, where they're, you know, the security of these systems is going to be pretty vital or um, people are going to get in trouble. Have you run into that being an issue yet? Well, so anytime that you uh, entrust your client's confidential information to a third party, you need to vet them as you would any other third party. So Iron Mountain, when you provide them with boxes of documents at the end of a case that you have to store for seven years, in New York at least it's seven years. Uh, process servers, when you give them documents that need to be served. The cleaning crews that come in and clean your law firm at the end of the day you have to somehow have spoken to someone who's responsible for the warehouse, for the cleaning crew. Um, you have to vet the process server. You have to vet those people or the hire, <clears throat> people that hire them to ensure that they are, they know who they're hiring, that they've made sure that these are reliable people, that there may be non-disclosure agreements in place or whatever the case may be. The same goes when you are entrusting your co client's confidential data to a on a vendor, a, you know, um, third party who will store that data on servers or use that um, data in their software as a service. So you have to vet those companies. And in my cloud computing book, I um, had 20 questions. I've since edited them and added more to that. It's available on the My Case website and some other places on their blog. And I think possibly in an above the law column that I wrote, but you need to carefully vet them. You need to understand who has access to the data. You need to understand how they handle that data, what security steps they take to preserve the physical servers that it's stored on and also the data that's stored on the servers. You need to understand how often the data is backed up. You wanna make sure there's geo redundancy, two different servers on two different coasts talking to each other fairly frequently to back that data up and ensure that it is, uh, so if one server goes down, the other server has data that's 10 minutes old so that you are not losing access to your data. So there's a lot of different things that you need to do to ensure that that data is secure, that it's backed up, and that it's um, not going to be leaked or 
unlawfully accessed by someone who might have access to it. So in any of those situations, anytime you do that, you do need to vet the provider. Yep, good good advice. I don't know if people always necessarily think to go through your 20 questions and they should. <laughs> um, speaking of uh, things determined with automation that helps you make the right decision, uh, it's time to thank our second sponsor for this episode of Triangulation and that is ZipRecruiter. Hiring used to be hard, multiple job sites, stacks of resumes, a confusing review process. But today hiring can be easy and you only have to go to one place to get it done. That place is ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invite them to apply for your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. And right now, Triangulation listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at our exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. Show your support for this show and ZipRecruiter by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash triangulation. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. All right, Nikki, just at the end of the show here, I wanted to just sort of step back a bit and take a breath and uh, have a conversation with you. You and I have been online for a long time and a lot has changed since we both uh, started using the various tools we've been discussing today. Uh, you've written, as you've mentioned, a couple of books on cloud computing and social networking, but those were several years ago. And I feel like if you were writing those books today, you might have different things that you wanted to impart. Right. Um, can you give us sort of your 10,000 view perspective on where we've been, where we are now, and where you think things are going? Well, it's the the net the social networks have changed really dramatically since I started using them. I was uh, I was one of the first lawyers on all these different um, platforms, and I was on most of them right when they rolled out, at least the major platforms. So Facebook, I was actually on it before it went public because I used my university an edu address I obtained from my um, the college I went to. Uh, Twitter, I was on, I created an account right after it rolled out, but I didn't go back to it until Kevin O'Keefe, he's the CEO of Lex blog, had written a blog post talking about the how he thought that Twitter was a social network that was worth checking out. So I went back and that's when I started to become active on Twitter. And then LinkedIn when it rolled out and I do have an Instagram account, I don't use it all that often. And I do have a Snapchat account, I don't use that very often. but. You know, Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn really have changed a lot since they initially rolled out. Twitter used to be, in my opinion, a lot more social than it is now. There are definitely clicks and there are influencers that people follow. And but it used to be a lot more social. And a lot of the social discussions moved from uh, initially they were in the blog comments. A lot of people shut the comments off because of all the spam. I did that. Uh, then it moved to Twitter simultaneously around that time. And then a lot of it moved to Facebook, especially when people started shutting their blog comments off. And so Facebook tends to be a place where people initially go for personal reasons, but they end up getting a lot of information to support their profession, at least in the legal space, and also just interact with other lawyers. So there's a group of women lawyers who are mothers on Facebook, for example, that is 11,000 members strong. They carefully vet the people to make sure that their lawyers were mothers, but it's a really active online group and they talk the discussion runs the gamut there are always referrals there are people asking um, for sort of high level advice about cases sometimes but typically that type of thing will occur offline but they'll see if someone's available to talk about it there's also discussions about potty training like it's lawyer mothers <laughs> or daycare issues so the discussions run the gamut but it's a really active group and i know that there's a one for women physicians that has like 40,000 plus members. So those are some really active area, active 
groups. That's I think the Facebook tends to be the place where you can get a really active group going. LinkedIn groups tend to have been problematic for that. People have always tried, but it didn't seem to work that well. But LinkedIn does seem to be gaining some traction compared to how it used to just sort of be a static resume site. They're gaining mm-hmm. traction in terms of people sharing professional content. Um, I have a lot of followers on LinkedIn because a number of years ago, they reached out to me and asked if they could highlight me as someone to follow in the legal space. So I have 200 plus thousand followers on LinkedIn. Um, and so I do tend to get a decent amount of traction whenever I post something there and find it to be valuable. Twitter, I find is more of a place now to sh- share information, news stories, and to get information that's relevant to your areas of practice, to connect with the media if that's relevant to what you do in, in your profession. It's a good place for that as well. And also just to find out if something's happening. Is an earthquake occurring? A couple of years ago, we had a small earthquake here in Rochester, like 5.0. But I was in a coffee shop and I wasn't sure if I was having a medical event or if there was actually an earthquake because it wasn't a huge earthquake. And so rather than ask a stranger next to me, I initially looked it up on Twitter. And sure enough, there were reports of an earthquake from other users on Twitter. So then I turned to someone and said, did you feel that? But I wanted to make sure on Twitter that it was actually (laughs) happening (laughs) before I made a fool of myself. Yeah. (laughs) So that's you can sometimes find out what's happening to you at that moment on Twitter. So. Yeah, but they're definitely changing. And and I have teenage kids. I have 15 and 17 year olds and I learn from them where things are going. They, they, the only reason they have Facebook accounts is because sometimes they can log into certain sites they want to use using their Facebook account. Um, they're on Instagram. They're on Snapchat. Those are really their social network um, platforms of choice. And there are all sorts of and most of their chat doesn't occur in Um, via SMS or iPhone messaging, it's in messaging on those different sites. So um, like private messages or group messages. So it's really interesting to see what they're doing and how they're using technology because that's where, that's the future of social networking, whatever they're doing, not what we're doing. So, right. Yeah, no, I agree. I have a 15 year old as well. And I see that as well, uh, that those are the platforms they use. And and uh, one person I would recommend that people read and follow if they're not already is Taylor Lawrence. She writes for The Atlantic. And um, if you, uh, she had a big art article, I think it just came out uh, yesterday, March 21, uh, about Instagram and the fact that although Facebook and Twitter have gotten headlines recently for um, dealing or publicly making statements about dealing with the hate speech and misinformation that is rife on their sites. Instagram is sort of flying under the radar and yet is full of that kind of information too. And reading this, it doesn't surprise me what they're finding. Um, It it does surprise me uh, that it hasn't gotten more public attention. uh, And it concerns me based on what you're saying, Nikki, that this is really, you know, where uh, young people go to interact. And if they're not, um, if they're being subjected to the site's algorithms, which are so great if you're a lawyer mom, right? And you wanna find other like-minded lawyer moms doing, you know, helping each other professionally and helping each other personally. um, The algorithms are great for that kind of thing because they will hook you up with like-minded people. They are really, really good at finding what interests you, finding similar things to what interests you. But that's true if what interests you is QAnon. And uh, right. that that kind of um, information, uh, leveraging meme accounts, et cetera, is, is more and more, you know, what um, young people may be subjected to. The uh, Taylor Lawrence here in this piece uh, gives some examples. First of all, she um, points out that Instagram has um, made it hard to do research about the site itself because it's really in the wake of Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica, you can understand why it would, uh, clamp down on its APIs and its ability to you know, have people export large uh, volumes of data and then be able to work with it. Um, so it's harder, but Taylor Lawrence here did some personal experimentation with her own Instagram account. God, I would hate to (laughs) undergo this in the name of journalism, but, uh, started following certain accounts and, and 
started seeing what happened, what then uh, she was suggested to follow and what she was exposed to. And she was very quickly um, shocked <laughs> and not pleased with the fact uh, that the information was there and how quickly it would be possible to begin to radicalize somebody who was exposed to this kind of stuff. Now, Taylor also did a piece, uh, it was it last summer um, that I also spotted back then that was um, also about teens on Instagram. Teens are debating the news on Instagram is what she wrote about then. And again, she was, ta she was touching on some of the fact that there's a lot of misinformation there, but she was also talking about the fact that um, a bunch of youngsters were banding together to form group accounts that would then sort of myth bust things and um, talk, you know, fact check and and do all kinds of, you know, we we are going to make sure that we have legitimate news and legitimate conversation and we're not going to just buy into all this junk that we're being served up on Instagram. So there are probably, you know, there are mitigating factors um, just by the fact that people don't want to necessarily be radicalized or subjected to uh, fake news or false information or what have you. Uh, but again, I, I just think it's interesting, as you point out, Nikki, this is the platform that will probably have the biggest impact on, for example, the next election in the United States. And it, it has sort of been flying under the radar as far as um, these uh, these issues are concerned. I don't think that that will continue. I think this kind of journalism, et cetera, will make Facebook uh, police Instagram the way it has its main platform. Do you agree? Well, it's uh, I I think that it's going to have to happen. It's like my 17 year old is going to be able to vote in the next election, presidential election. So and and these kids, I thought it was interesting that you brought the news up because I was going to mention that that's where my kids get the news is from mm -hmm. memes on Instagram. These memes mm -hmm. are created instantaneously when some major piece of news breaks. And I thought it was so funny. I can't remember what had happened that day, but my kids were aware of it and they were talking about it to each other and they'd seen it on a meme on Instagram. So it's just so funny to me that that's how they're getting their news from memes, not even from articles. And you know how, I, I mean, how do you fact check a meme? It's not like you can click on a link. There are images, there are static images. So it's interesting to me that, I mean, how easily it would be to get it wrong. And you're not sure who's even creating these memes. But then again, you can say the same thing about journalism, right? With fake news and and that, that concept of fake news and people coming at the news from different political ideologies. Um, a lot of people are arguing that both sides are getting it wrong and there's a medium, a happy medium somewhere. But in any event, it. It's definitely Instagram and and these kids are it's a really interesting generation this gen gen Z I guess the gen Z they're really interesting they're my kids constantly sort of check me and my sometimes stereotypes they don't even realize that I have they'll kind of check me and correct me and you know they're very interesting they're very open minded they grew up um where things are normal that were not normal when we were growing up you know legalization of marijuana, gay marriage. Um, to them, this is just how things are. A African American president, you know, this is they're a very different generation and having these smartphones and access to information and the ability to communicate with each other all the time on these smartphones. And a lot of the studies are showing that they're drinking later, they're having sex later, they're doing drugs later, um, in part because they're not getting together in big groups and running around in packs in towns anymore. They're interacting on their phones more often. It's not to say they don't have friends. My kids have very active social lives, but they're not always together in big groups like that outside of school. So it's definitely an interesting generation. It's interesting to see how they're using social media and they're a big generation too, and they're very quickly going to be um, impactful um, as they come of age. So it'll definitely be interesting to see where it goes. Yeah, and it'll be incumbent on the folks running the platforms that they're using to make sure that not only are they uh, taking steps to make sure the adults are being served legitimate content, but right. uh, the younger generation too. <clears throat> uh, Taylor Lawrence points out too that in December, Wired had a piece about Instagram becoming the go-to social network for the internet research agency, the Russian troll farm, notorious for meddling in the US election. So uh, Facebook is gonna need to pay attention to this platform and make sure that it is 
um, applying the same sort of prophylactic measures to it that it does uh, Facebook itself. I think that's uh, wishful thinking that yeah. Facebook's not paying attention to anything. The, the headline late yesterday t- and today is that Facebook had millions and millions of passwords in text, you know, the unencrypted Clear text. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what's going on over there. And then another thing was that the um, testimony, I think, before Congress or some of the documents that were entered into evidence indicated that Facebook knew about the problems um, in relation to the election and the um, false information being spread by those Russian um, into Russian groups or whatever the by the government really uh, they knew about it a lot earlier than they said they did so I, I think it's uh, I think it's I, I would like to think Facebook would do the responsible thing but I don't know I'm not holding my breath to think that they're going to start regulating Instagram in a way that's meaningful in time for this next election or just yeah. just in that's time just- to control the spread of misinformation and racism and hate but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, lawmakers may make them. There's certainly a not a lot of scrutiny, and and there's certainly not a lot you know that we can do as parents. I mean, we can we can have conversations about right. the fact that yeah, Instagram isn't news, and memes aren't news, and fact check <laughs> things, and make sure you know what your uh, you have a good foundation for what your belief system is. Uh, but you know, you have a 15 and a 17 year old. You know how much they listen to that. <laughs> Not I think much. they listen more than you think they do. They okay. don't act like they're listening, but I, I will listen to them talk to each other, and they, they listen. And they're, you got to teach your kids to be. I mean, this is a different topic for a different day, but you got to teach them to be um, critical thinkers. And I think as attorneys, we may be, knock on wood, hopefully better equipped in some ways to do that because we have training in that regard. But you gotta, and you gotta talk to them when they want to talk to you. <laughs> so yeah. that's not when you're in the mood to talk, but. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we'll have you back to do the parenting episode of Triangulation <laughs> with Nicole Black. Uh, but today I have thoroughly enjoyed talking about law and tech and their intersection with you. And thank you so much for taking the time. I know we do long interviews here and, and they always just fly by for me. I hope you had the same experience. It was, and, it was uh, really It was great. Yeah, it's been great catching up with you. Uh, Folks, we do triangulation every week here at the TWIT Network. We uh, start recording at 11.30 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, we hope that you come back and tune in to other shows uh, here on the network. Uh, This is one of my all-time favorites, and I hope you feel that way too. I love these long-form discussions with people who have been there, done that, think a lot about the important issues impacting ourselves and our businesses in the realm of technology and the use of technology. So once again, Nicole Black, thank you so much for joining us today and thank all of you for joining us for this episode of Triangulation. Uh, We hope that you tune back in next week. Until then, take care.